Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this information session for the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, my name is Juan Martinez Munoz. I am an assistant director of admissions here at the university. Um, myself, along with three of my colleagues today, will be going through the information here that we have, some fun information, insightful information, hopefully helpful information about the university uh, that we'd like to share with you today. So if Rachel, Jasmine, and Jarrett would like to introduce themselves real quick. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Rachel Colton. Um, I'm one of the assistant directors of admission here at the University of Massachusetts, um, and I'm also an alum of the university. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine Rosario. I am one of the senior assistant directors of admission here at UMass Amherst, and I work on our diversity recruitment team. Hi everyone, my name is Jared Saunders. I'm also a senior assistant director and also a proud alum of our university. Awesome, thank you all for sharing. And also just another just warm welcome to everyone who's coming in and just watching this. Um, this is going to be a, a, our agenda for the day. So we're going to just start off with an overview of University of Massachusetts Amherst. So that'll include some fast facts, uh, some highlights as well. And then from there, we're going to touch on the application process and procedures. And then we're going to finish it up on ways to stay connected, including some of our other virtual uh, options as well. So we're going to get started. Uh, Rachel, if you want to get us going. Yes, definitely. So hi again, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off with just um, a kind of a broad overview here about the University of Massachusetts. Um, so UMass Amherst is the flagship campus for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we have a little over 24,000 undergraduate students and then a little over 7,000 graduate students. Um, so for kind of a grand total of a little over 31,000 total students. Um, we are uh, always ranked one of the top public universities in the country. Um, we're also, uh, we also have over more than 300 registered student organizations, um, over 100 degree programs, and then uh, we're located in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, Amherst, Mass is definitely a college town, uh, and we're in the western part of the state, about an hour and a half from Boston, about three and a half hours from New York City, um, but like I said, definitely a college town. Uh, we're always voted one of the top, top college towns in the country. Um, also, I like to talk about here in the intro uh, that we're part of a five college consortium. Um, so what that means is that we are associated with four other schools in our area, and those are Smith College, Mount Holyoke College, Hampshire College, and Amherst College. Um, so how this system works is you can take classes um, at these other four schools at no extra cost. It's already included in your tuition. Uh, so you're paying for one school, but you have access to five schools. Uh, you also have access to all of their resources, their academics, their libraries, their events. Um, it's basically the shared system that we have. Um, and I like to bring that up now because it really adds to the whole college community, college feel um, of the area. Um, you are literally surrounded by college students, which means that all of the restaurants, all of the events, all of the shops, uh, they're all geared towards college students. Um, so this little Pioneer Valley uh, area that we're in, it's very unique um, in that it's uh, majority uh, college students. Um, so it's kind of this little special place that we live in. And then one of my favorite ranks, um, and pretty much one of the only ranks that I uh, personally um, like to mention, I think it's the most important, uh, is that we are number one for best campus dining. Um, the food here is absolutely incredible, uh, and we've had that rank for five years in a row, um, so we're very proud of that. Uh, so if you do get a chance to visit campus um, when everything uh, clears up a bit, uh, hopefully you get a chance to eat in one of our dining halls or one of our eateries on campus um, because it is literally the best. Um, so we're number one for best campus dining. All right, so the next um, slide that uh, we want to go through um, is just this UMass community feel. Um, and, uh, you know, this basically just gives you a little bit of um, a representation um, of the diversity and the student body that we have here on campus. Um, so you can see there's some different in, different stats there, different information, um, and hopefully you're going to get this sense um, of community throughout this session um, with, uh, from me and my colleagues. Um, hopefully you'll hear that word a couple times throughout this session. Um, you'll get this sense of community. Um, so even though we are one of a, you know, a larger university here in New England, um, there's definitely ways to make that uh, university smaller, you know, by getting involved, um, by meeting people, finding your niche, you know, finding your people. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. And we're going to talk about um, a few of those uh, here today during the session. Um, but again, hopefully you get that sense of community uh, from us during the session. And um, we actually, one of the questions we get a lot is what is a typical student at UMass? Um, and I have a little video to show you um, what a typical student uh, looks like um, because there actually is no typical student at UMass. So I think this video does a really good job at explaining that. So we'll watch this. We are the revolutionaries of today. Not waiting for change. 
but creating it. By asking questions and questioning answers. Because our calling is a better tomorrow. At the University of Massachusetts Amherst, a revolutionary spirit runs through our veins. It inspires us to think in new ways, to challenge convention, not to simply be different, but to actually make a difference in Massachusetts, the place where it all began. By looking into space, thinking there must be more, and then going out and proving it, where we don't see obstacles, but opportunities. That's what revolutionaries do. We embrace the freedom to dream bigger, to dig deeper, and to never back down from the impossible. Our future is in our very own hands. We are pioneers, builders, unconventional doers, committed to the relentless pursuit of progress. Be revolutionary. We are the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Awesome. Um, so I really like that video because I think it does a really good job at showing, um, you know, not only a visual, you know, aspect of campus, um, but it also shows, um, you know, what UMass is, what we're, what we're kind of all about. Um, and this is UMass. You know, students come from all parts of the world, uh, enriching our community with diversity in gender, race, ethnicity, uh, geographic location, culture, academic interest, and more. Um, it's a really empowering campus community where not only we're preparing you to be fully skilled uh, in your major, um, but we're also supporting students' commitment and drive to positively impact their communities in the world. Um, so again, I hope you got that sense from, the, um, from that video and then from um, just kind of what we talk about here during the session. Um, so I'm actually going to hand it over now to Jasmine and she's going to uh, take the next section. Thanks, Rachel. So as you saw in the video and as you heard Rachel explain, UMass is home for a very diverse student body. Students come from all over the country as well as various parts of the world. And they really enrich our campus with um, not only ethnic diversity, religious diversity, gender diversity, but also diversity in thought and experiences. And as such, it's really important for us to affirm that we are an institution that's committed to making sure that all students, no matter their background or identity, feel welcome on our campus but also feel safe um, and supported so that they can thrive. We're committed to denouncing all forms of racial violence um, and institutional racism. Uh, we don't stand for any forms of discrimination, bigotry, um, and we you know, are really proud of the fact that we are a campus that embraces students from all walks of life um, because that's important to our campus culture. Um, some of the things that we're doing on our campus um, on an administrative level is through various programs and then initiatives. So you can see right here some of the ways that we are seeking to build inclusive, um, well-represented diverse spaces. We have uh, various programs through various departments um, and rather than kind of go into much detail about each of them. If you're interested in kind of looking at each of these initiatives and learning more about not only these, but others that we have on our campus, feel free to visit our website at umass.edu slash diversity. Um, not only are we making effort to build a strong community on an administrative level, we also are making sure that we're doing so among our student body uh, because you guys are you know, what make our campus community um, and enrich our spaces. So beyond our administration, um, we have various departments and offices that are also dedicated to our mission. Uh, we have our various cultural centers that are supported by the Center for Multicultural Advancement and Student Success. Um, each year, each semester, they roll out programming, initiatives, um, special speaker series, um, and the cultural centers specifically really focus on uplifting historically marginalized communities and build cultural awareness. Um, so you can see some of the cultural centers that we have here, um, whether you identify with any of these um, uh, cultures or not, and you're interested in learning more about these cultures, it's very important to take advantage of these opportunities. So 
feel free to visit um, umass.edu slash cmass where you can learn more about what they do as well as um, the cultural centers. And then beyond that, we have our disability service centers, we have our Stonewall Center, we have various religious organizations, our Office of Student Success, uh, our Campus Safety, right? So a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different uh, departments and offices that are dedicated to making sure that this is really in a vibrant, enriched community that supports people from all walks of life. Um, we know that when students feel supported, when they feel seen, when they feel safe, they thrive. And then thriving means that you're able to embrace all of the different uh, opportunities that we have here, whether it's through networking, whether it's through internships and, and co-ops, whether it's through research or our extracurricular activities, and of course, our academics, which is why you're here for the most part to get an academic major and to study something that you're interested in. So here at UMass Amherst, we have endless academic opportunities. We have about 90 majors that are housed in nine schools and colleges. Um, and so as Rachel mentioned in the beginning, you can find a smaller community here in our larger community. And one of those first communities that you join is your school or college. So for example, if you're interested in majoring in biology, chemistry, physics, you will be part of the College of Natural Sciences. Or if you're interested in English, math, um, I'm sorry, not math, English history, music or art, you can be part of our College of um, Humanities and Fine Arts. So I'm not gonna list them all for you, you can find them on our website, but just know that you will become part of a smaller community as soon as you step foot on this campus. If you're not sure what you're interested in majoring in, not to worry, um, although we don't have a true undecided, meaning you won't see uh, an option for undecided on our common application, we do have what we call exploratory tracks, where you let us know which school or college you'd be interested in exploring, and then you're essentially undeclared in that school or college, and you have some time before you have to declare a major. So even if you aren't sure, you still get to join one of our smaller communities in those schools and colleges. You get assigned an academic advisor who's going to uh, you know, help you and guide you through your four years here. Um, and if you ever decide you want to change your mind and you are not, you know, you don't want to stay in the major that you started off with, no one's going to be surprised about that. That is the whole point of coming to college to kind of uh, navigate your way and figure out what it is that you want to study. So your advisor will help you through that process. Or maybe you want to add additional uh, course studies, right? Maybe you're thinking I want to double major or I want to double minor, or I want to major minor or I want to add a certificate. There's a variety of combinations that you can do. Um, so even though you can only start off here with one major, after your first year there's opportunities to add more, right? Um, and so you can become part of two schools or colleges or more based on what it is that you are studying. Uh, so among those nine schools and colleges, some are considered competitive schools and colleges um, and some are not. And what that means is that when we're doing our holistic review, uh, there's additional things that we're looking for to admit you into those competitive schools and colleges, perhaps specific course requirements, perhaps um, higher academic requirements. Um, and so when we get to the part of this uh, presentation where we talk about what we're looking for, we'll get into more detail about what they're looking for for competitive majors. But just know that there are differences in where you apply. In addition to our nine schools and colleges, we also have Commonwealth Honors College, which I will re refer to as CHC moving forward. Uh, CHC is our honors college. It is available to all students. You are not limited to any specific major. Um, and so if you're interested in taking more academically rigorous courses, if you're interested in doing additional coursework, um, like a senior project, which all of our CHC students do, um, then it's a great opportunity. Um, 80% of our classes have about 40 students or less, and then about 20% 20 20 of our classes have some of those larger lectures that you think about when you think of a large school. When you are in Commonwealth Honors, um, classes are capped at 25. So if having a really small class is something that seems desirable to you, then definitely consider uh, looking into CHC. There are two opportunities to be admitted into CHC. Um, if you apply to UMass Amherst through the Common App, Right away, we're gonna review you for CHC and potentially invite you to join the program. Um, and if you're not invited right at the time of admission, then you can apply during your four years here at any point um, and express your interest in 
in joining CHC. So there are endless opportunities to join um, and we will get into more detail when we talk about the admission process about how it is and what it is that we're looking for um, at the time of admission and then once you're here as well. We also have research and internship opportunities here. Um, so we are a research school. We are known as a research school. Um, we are among some of the top schools in the country for research, and we receive a lot of funding to support that. So beyond Commonwealth Honors, you don't have to be an honor student to take advantage of research. Um, obviously, those opportunities are there. But if you're not an honor student, you still have endless opportunities to do so. Um, and you can start as early as your first year. So you don't have to wait until you are um, an upperclassman. You don't have to wait until you're going off into higher level degrees. You can start right away, kind of exploring things that you're interested in. Um, and we also have really amazing professors here who are doing their own research. Um, our full-time tenured professors are actually required to do their research and they are not just teaching you the subjects that they are experts in, but they are constantly working and learning within their respective fields as well. So often uh, our professors are looking for research assistants. Um, so if you have a, a desire to do some research, but maybe you don't have a full-fledged idea just yet, uh, being a research assistant is a great way to kind of get your foot in the door and start experiencing what it is like to do research on the campus before you go off and do your own. Um, we also have internships and co-op opportunities. So of course, it's important for you to get some real world experience, real life experience, work experience before you graduate. Our employers, your employers like to see that. They would like to see that on your resumes. Um, and so we have a career service center on our campus dedicated to all students that will help you access internships and co-ops. And then your respective schools and colleges as well have career centers that will help you access them. So you won't be doing anything on your own, um, but it is about self-advocacy. So nobody's gonna be you know, chasing you down saying it's time for an internship, but if that's something that you wanna do, then there's lots of support to help you access them. Um, so you can earn credit right and not be taking classes you can do it in conjunction with your classes um, or you can kind of take a break travel and get some uh, work experience that way as well so you would meet with your advisor talk about um, what are some of the things that you're interested in doing and then they'll start putting you in the right direction one of the nice things about uh, umass amherst is that we have a very large alumni network um, so whenever our schools and colleges are hosting career fairs um, and different employers come to our campus to meet our students and see um, what our students are interested in a lot of times they are uh, the tables are kind of being represented by UMass Amherst alum. So our alum get really excited about coming back to our campus and giving our students opportunities for internships. So it's a great relationship and networking uh, experience for you to access those internships and co-ops. So, you know, as you navigate your way through college, there's so many moving parts that you're gonna to have to juggle. Um, and you do have support services, so you're not gonna be alone in any of that process. But it is also important for you guys to you know, manage your well-being and make sure that you, know, you have all the support services that you need um, so that you don't feel overwhelmed or stressed, even though that might be you know, something that happens anyway. You're in college, you have several classes to take, you're kind of figuring out your schedule. When do I fit in studying? When do I fit in my extracurriculars? Now I have this research opportunity. Now I have these internships. Um, and we wanna make sure that we provide you with as many tools as possible to help you navigate your way through your four years here. Um, so we have our university health services. Um, we have our center for counseling and psychological health. Uh, we have our rec center. If you just wanna stay active, various ways for you to stay healthy. Um, and we know this year more than ever, right, that staying healthy is important. Um, all of us are home. We are connecting virtually. Um, we can't go outside as much as we used to. And we want to make sure that not only are you guys physically healthy, but that you're mentally healthy as well. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about what the campus is doing uh, right now during these unprecedented times, um, feel free to visit our website at umass.edu slash coronavirus. Um, that's updated frequently, and it will help you stay on top of how this campus is ever-changing and you know, really taking um, into consideration the changes that we're all going through. 
So now I'm gonna pass it over to Jarrett, who's gonna tell you more about our admission process, the good stuff that you've been waiting for. Right, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, first I'm gonna talk about the timeline uh, and when, what you can expect uh, over the uh, application process. So, uh, so I'll start with our application deadlines. We do have two deadlines. Uh, one is our early action deadline, which is non-binding, meaning you can apply to our school and as many others as you'd like. Uh, you can apply early action by uh, November 5th, and then we generally will let folks know uh, about the right around the first of the year, or first week in January, uh, whether or not you've been admitted. Uh, so that's a good way, you know, for one of your uh, for one of your top choices. And if you're uh, uh, happy with wh where your co courses are and your grades are through junior year, uh, you may want to consider applying early action. And I say that because if you apply early action, there is no guarantee that we're going to see your uh, your senior grades. Uh, really depends on when your school releases them, and we start reading right around November 5th. So. Uh, if we don't have your senior grades, we're not we're not going to see them when we read your application. If we read it, uh, you know, right away uh, in early November. So keep that in mind. If if you if you really feel like you, you want us to see your senior grades, and you think that's really going to put you over the top, uh, you may want to consider waiting till regular decision. So that that's up to you uh, whether you want to make that uh, that that call. But uh, regular decision applications are due on January 15th. And, uh, and when you uh, apply regular decision, you do find out uh, during the month of March, okay? Uh, so the, the next step after you apply uh, for admission uh, is that uh, you wanna apply for financial aid. If you're going to apply for financial aid, the only form that we require is the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Uh, that you can start applying starting October 1st, but you wanna make sure you get it all done by March 1st, okay? Uh, that way you'll, uh, Qualify for the most uh, the most uh, financial aid. So you want to make sure you get that in as soon as uh, as, as soon as you can, but uh, definitely before March first. And then we release decisions. Like I said, we release our decisions for early action uh, about the first week in January, and then for regular decision during the month of March. And uh, and it, you can be uh, admitted, of course. You can be uh, denied. Uh, Admission. If we don't feel like you meet, you uh, meet quite quite meet the criteria to uh, to to get in here, but you can also be waitlisted. Okay, so uh, and you can be waitlisted from early action or from uh, from regular decision. And if you're waitlisted, we're gonna sort of uh, to, you know the name implies it. It's kind of a, a waiting uh, period where we may not be able to admit you right away into our uh, fall class. But uh, as time goes on, if we get more academic information from you, and as our numbers shape up, we may be able to uh, to to admit you later in the process. So, uh, so those are the three sort of outcomes that you can expect: either being admitted, being waitlisted, or being uh, denied admission. Uh, and then, if you are admitted, you will receive your financial aid award usually uh, within a couple weeks or so of, of being admitted. And then uh, if you decide that we're the school for you, you wanna submit your enrollment fee uh, by May 1st, okay? And that's a national deadline. Every school uh, requires you to, uh, to provide an answer for them, whether, like, whether or not you'd like to uh, uh, commit to the university, whether you'd like to accept their offer of admission, you wanna do that by May 1st, okay? So that's the general timeline. And now I wanna talk a little bit about our application requirements, what we look for in our applications. And the first thing I wanna say is that uh, as you can see here, we use the common application, which is uh, uh, you know, fairly common. Uh, uh, you'll see that at a lot of different schools, but that's our only application. We, we only use the common application exclusively. And, uh, and we use a, a holistic review process, okay? Meaning that we're using the, your whole application. We're looking at the whole application, the whole applicant. Uh, we're not just looking at the numbers uh, you know, grades, test scores, that sort of thing. We're looking at a variety of things to, uh, to determine whether or not we can admit you to the university. So, uh, but be, even though it's a holistic process, all of the parts aren't necessarily created equal. Uh, you know, there are some parts that are sort of, we're gonna start with and we're gonna kind of uh, have a, a more of a basis on your decision. And then the other parts of the application will kind of fill in the blanks and complete the puzzle, okay? The more context we have, the more uh, we can make a decision that's not just based on numbers. So we're going to start with your transcript, okay? So the transcript, uh, we, we get a lot of information from there. We, we see your overall GPA, uh, we see how you got there, and we see what types of classes you've taken. So when we look at your, at your grade point average, we're going to recalculate your GPA, 
and uh, and we have our own weighting system that we use uh, for your honors classes, your AP courses, uh, IB courses, and early college classes that you might be taking. Okay, so as you can see here on the on the uh, on the screen, uh, we have some averages here, or the middle 50%, I should say. So uh, for the class of 2023. There, uh, the, the middle 50% of those who were admitted, they had between a 3.7 and a 4.2 GPA. And like I said, that is a weighted GPA. So that, that's with our recalculation and with our, our weighting. So as you think of your own GPA that you get from your high school, it might be a little bit different than, uh, than what we uh, end up recalculating for you. So keep that in mind. Uh, and also keep in mind that that's the middle 50%. Okay, so that means that 25% of the students that we admitted had less than a 3.7. Uh, 25% had uh, more than a 4.2. Okay, so that's just the, the middle group kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of, of, of what we're looking at in terms of the, the, the grade point average for uh, students who were admitted. Okay, uh, so when also when we're looking at your transcript, we're considering the trends. We want to see uh, that your grades are either consistently good throughout your, your four years of high school or that you made improvements over the years. We know that sometimes people start a little shaky in, in ninth grade and then uh, they, as they get their, their feet wet, they get a little bit stronger as time goes on, you improve in sophomore and junior year, and then finish strong in the senior year. We'd love to see that. Uh, we like to see that students grow and, and, and improve throughout high school. Uh, we don't wanna see the opposite. We don't wanna see your grades decline as you make your way towards college. Okay, so, uh, so as long as we see consistently good grades or uh, improvement over the years, that's what we like to see. And then we're also looking at the types of classes you've taken. We do want to see that you challenge yourself uh, where it's applicable. If you can take those upper level courses, those honor courses, AP courses, things like that, those are always good to see on, on your transcript. Uh, and we're not looking at it like where we're, uh, you know, counting honors courses or counting AP courses. It's not, it's not so much that. We're looking at your, your, you know, your overall sort of balanced schedule. We want to see that you challenge yourself within the context of your own abilities and within the, within the context of what your school offers for honors or AP courses or, or IB or college courses. Okay, so we don't, we're not, you know, counting courses. We're really just, just wanna make sure you have a good, strong uh, uh, academic schedule throughout your four years and that you get uh, strong grades in those courses, okay? So uh, one thing that you'll see here is that we, we, we provide a range for the SAT and ACT and that's uh, for this year and for the next few years. That's uh, just for reference purposes only because we are test optional now, okay? So we're not gonna be considering your uh, SAT or ACT scores. You can submit them and we can, we can look at them, uh, and, you know, and if, they, if they're good, they're certainly a positive thing, but we're, because we're test optional, uh, we're not really using that as, uh, as a criterion for, uh, for admission. So, uh, so that's something that, that's a little different. Uh, it has changed over the, the past few years. So that makes that holistic review that much more important. And the other parts of the application are gonna be, become that much more important in terms of determining whether or not we can admit you. So some of those other parts of the application you'll see listed here uh, with your essay. The common application provides uh, several different topics to choose from. Uh, they're all some sort of personal statement, which is good because we don't do interviews here. We don't have ad admissions interviews. So the only way that we can hear your voice through the application process is through the essay. So that's, uh, it's important. We do read all the essays. So that's, uh, that's a, a, a part of the application that's good that we're gonna consider as part of this uh, holistic review. Another part uh, would be uh, the supplemental questions. Uh, we do ask a couple of extra questions uh, above and beyond the essay, and they're, they're, they're short answers. They're not full on essays, but they're just sort of paragraph answers. We ask you why you're interested in UMass Amherst and why you're interested in the major that you've chosen. Again, just adds more context, gives us a, a better sense of, of, uh, of your, your, your application as a whole, okay? Uh, a couple more things I want to mention too in relation to those, uh, to the questions in relation to your essay. Uh, there is a separate question this year for, uh, for COVID-19 uh, and its effects it's had in, in, in your life and your academics and your family, that sort of thing. So you don't necessarily have to write your whole essay about that because there is a separate question for that on the common application. And there's another section called additional information uh, where it's just a free form uh, paragraph where if there's something that doesn't neatly fit into the rest of the application, something that you want us to know about you or about your situation, uh, that's a great place to talk about. And again, you can write your essay about whatever you want to write your essay on, then the additional information can be about a, a specific thing. So if you had some uh, academic struggles in 10th grade, you want to tell us what happened and why, why, why that occurred. 
you can use it for that. Uh, you can use the additional information for that. Uh, if you uh, participated in an activity that you want to elaborate on, uh, you can talk about that in, in the additional information. Just another way to add context to the application for us as readers. Uh, so another part of the application that we're going to consider are the letters of recommendation. Now we require one letter and that needs to come either from a uh, school counselor or a teacher. Okay. Uh, I would say on average people send two, uh, usually they send one from each, one from a counselor, one from a teacher. Uh, you can send a couple of teacher apps, whatever it is. Uh, you know, we don't need more than three or four of them. But uh, as long as we have that one letter of recommendation, that's important because it just gives us a, a, another, uh, another viewpoint as to uh, uh, whether or not you could do well here. All right, so letter, the letter of recommendation is important. We're also looking at your activities, okay? So we're, when we're looking at your activities, we wanna know what else interests you outside of your academic interests, but we also wanna know what you do with your time outside of the classroom. So we're not just talking about, uh, about just school-based activities, uh, although those are important and they're great to see, but if you do activities outside of the classroom, outside of, outside of school, uh, things in your community, if you do community service, things like that, we wanna know about those as well. But we also wanna know about uh, part-time jobs. If you happen to have a job, a lot of times uh, students forget to put their, their jobs on their activities list because they don't see it as an activity per se, but uh, it is something that takes uh, a lot of time out of your day. It's something that uh, shows responsibility. It's very, it's very much a positive thing that, that we like to see on an application. Uh, and it also gives us more context, gives us an idea of what you're doing outside of the classroom. If we see that you don't have a lot of uh, activities, like traditional activities, uh, in, you know, in addition to your studies, but then we see that you work 20 hours a week at a, at a Dunkin' Donuts or something like that, then we, we, we get it. We understand what you're doing outside of the classroom, and that's important and that, uh, that you're still doing something worthwhile uh, uh, besides just, just uh, taking courses and, and going to school. So, uh, so it's very important to include that. I, I can't reiterate that enough because so many students forget to put that on their application, and we, we really do want to know that. So those are some of the things that we look at outside of the classroom. And there are, and, and, and on the application uh, as a whole, those are the sort of the components of that holistic review. Now there are some majors, and Jasmine alluded to this earlier, uh, as far as uh, competitive majors, uh, there are some majors that have uh, particular requirements above and beyond our, our, our general requirements. Uh, because of their size and popularity, we have to be a little more, a little bit more selective, uh, so that the numbers don't get out of control as far as, as far as how many students are in these uh, in these majors. So the the majors that that fall under this category are those that are under the Eisenberg School of Management, so your your business majors, uh, the engineering majors, your computer science major, and the nursing major. Okay. Uh, so generally speaking, the, the common denominator with these, uh, with these majors is they're looking for strength in math, okay? Uh, so they're going to look at your, at your grades and your math courses and uh, in the other parts of your application to determine whether or not you, uh, you, you can qualify for these particular uh, majors. And they each have their own sort of esoteric uh, things that they're looking for, but generally speaking, they are looking for strength in math uh, and an overall strength of, of your application, okay, uh, to different degrees. And for the, the, uh, the School of Management, for Engineering, and for Computer Science, uh, we may consider you for a second choice major uh, when you apply to the university. So on the common application, you'll see two spaces, one for your first choice, one for your second choice major. So we do recommend that if you're applying for one of the uh, competitive majors, one of the more selective majors, you're going to want to put a second choice that, uh, that doesn't fall under the selected category, which is to say most of our majors uh, do not fall in that category. If you're applying to journalism, communication, economics, uh, those are all open majors, okay? Uh, th those are our majors that if you put them down as your first choice, you get into the university, you'll get into the major. So you want to put one of those other majors as your second choice so that if we can't put you into your first choice major, we have some place to put you if you still qualify in general for, for admission to the university. Uh, so you may want to put something that is related to, to what you're applying in your, for your first choice. So for example, if you're applying to the School of Management, one of the business majors, you may want to put economics as a second choice major because that's a uh, very, very much a related major. And it's, it's, uh, it's something where if you don't get into, into the School of Management, you can get into economics and you may be able to work your way into the School of Management once you're here. Same goes for engineering. If you're applying for engineering, uh, you may want to put physics or mathematics as your second choice. So 
uh, you know, keep keep that in mind as you're as you're deciding what type of majors to put down in your first and second choices. You want to make sure that second choice is a non-competitive major, so we can put you somewhere once we uh, if, if we can still admit you. Okay. Uh, the exception to that would be the nursing major. Nursing uh, is unique in that you have to get into nursing in your freshman year, your first year. Uh, when you apply to the university, you have one chance of getting into that major. They don't allow students to transfer into it uh, from other majors. So you have to get nursing in that, in that first try. Generally speaking, if you apply to nursing and you don't meet their particular requirements, even if you still meet our general requirements, we, we generally will not admit you uh, into a second choice major. Uh, because we find that most uh, students who want nursing want nursing more than they want a particular uh, college or university. Uh, so they'll go to wherever they got into nursing. So, uh, so we find that it's, it's much more uh, efficient and, and, and much more uh, realistic to, to not admit students into a second choice if they apply nursing. Now we will make exceptions to that on a case by case basis. Uh, and that's something you just want to let us know in the application if you really feel like you would come here for a second choice major, something like public health or psychology, something like that, and you wanna put that down as your second choice and let us know that you would come for a second choice major, we will take a look at your application. If it happens to be a particularly strong application, we may consider you for, for a second choice, but that happens on a case by case basis. But you need to know that in general, we do not admit students into a second choice if, they, if you apply for nursing, okay? Uh, but like I said, most of our, our other majors are open majors. You put it down as your first choice, you get into the university, you get into the major. Um, there are uh, some majors that are based on uh, auditions and portfolios, our, our music, art, architecture, and dance majors. Uh, do you have an extra component? So if you're applying to music or dance, you'll have to set up an audition with those departments. Uh, if you're applying for art or architecture, you do need to submit a portfolio. So those are two part uh, sort of application processes. We in the admissions office will determine whether you are admitted to the university based on your academics and the other uh, uh, parts of the holistic review. The uh, individual departments will determine whether or not you get into art, architecture, music or dance based on your portfolio or uh, uh, your audition respectively. Okay. Uh, and then if you're applying, uh, if you don't know exactly what you want to major in right off the bat, that's okay. About 25% of our students come in uh, without a specific major. Uh, so you certainly wouldn't be alone there. And as Jasmine mentioned earlier, uh, we do have something that we call exploratory tracks where you can come in as, a, as an undecided major, but it's not fully undecided. You do have to sort of choose a general area of study. They're very broad and they're not binding, but it's just a way to kind of give you an academic home when you first get here. So uh, you can apply to uh, the, the, the natural sciences, exploratory track, the humanities, social sciences, very broad areas that again are, are, are not binding, but they're just a way to, to make sure you have the right advising, at least in the general area that you're considering. And then that advisor will help you narrow it down to a specific major uh, so that uh, after that two year period that you're, for, that you're here, you can be in a specific major. Okay, so, uh, so that's how it works if you're applying to uh, competitive majors or to any sp uh, specific major. And, uh, and the other thing I want to talk about uh, is getting into the, the Honors College, uh, CHC, or uh, uh, Commonwealth Honors College. Jasmine talked a little bit about this, but uh, we do consider all students uh, for the Honors College, uh, all uh, applicants, I should say. So when you apply to the university, you don't have to, there, there's no special box or anything you have to uh, uh, check off that you're interested in, in, in the Honors College. Uh, if you want to mention that you that you have some interest in it, you can certainly do that uh, when you talk about your, uh, you know, the, in your supplemental question. If you're if you're interested in in, uh, in the honors college, it's certainly a nice thing to mention there. But uh, but it's not that we're you know you're not submitting an, a separate application for the honors college. All of our applicants are considered. Uh, we don't have a straight sort of. Uh, you know, uh, number system as to, you know, what sort of GPA that you need to, to get into the Honors College, but do know that you, you, you do need to, to generally be towards the upper end of the, of the, uh, the range that I gave you. Typically students uh, who are admitted into the Honors College are in that, that upper range, uh, you know, in, in the 4.0-ish category uh, in terms of their, their, uh, their GPA. Okay, but we are uh, looking even more into those other parts of your application. It's, it's an even deeper holistic review where we're considering uh, not only the, uh, the, the GPA, but uh, your activities, your leadership, your life experiences, the major you've chosen, 
all of those things come into play when we're looking at uh, at, at students for the honors college. So it's uh, it's more selective, but it's more subjective as well. Uh, so only about 10% of the students who, who apply to the university will get into the honors college uh, right away. Uh, but as Jasmine mentioned earlier, most of our students do get into the honors college once they're already here. You have an option of getting into the honors college uh, once you're here. You have that opportunity as early as the second semester of your of your first year. You can apply directly to the honors college. It's it's a much more forgiving uh, a process at that point. You can apply directly to the honors college, and and if you get in, you can take advantage of all they have to offer from sophomore year on. Uh, so that's how most students get into the Honors College is, is once they're here. So a few students will get in right off the bat. Most of them get in while, while they're here. So uh, that's certainly something to consider. Uh, so, uh, so that's all I have to say about, uh, about the application process. I'll pass it off to Juan and uh, he can uh, talk a little bit about uh, funding and, and other parts of the, uh, the application. Awesome, thank you, Jared. So yeah, we're gonna go over real quick, cost and aid and our other online events, and then we'll be wrapping things up. So just hang in there a little while longer, but we're in the home stretch now. So as you can see here, uh, this is just a breakdown of our costs for in-state and out-of-state students. Uh, these figures are overestimates, they're rounding up to the highest price point for everything. Um, nothing is waived. So this is what the total cost would be if you had to pay the full sticker price um, I should note that almost nobody pays the full sticker price. Um, your expected family contribution would have to be um, a decent amount um, above what the cost of attendance is for you for that to be the case. So um, like Jared had mentioned earlier, earlier fill out your financial aid form, you know, the, the better uh, financial aid package you will be likely to get. Um, it is also worth noting I'm not a trained financial aid expert. so. I can't get into too much of the nitty gritty details for this, but uh, make sure you jot down the information here for the contact information for financial aid and the website. So they'll have a lot more comprehensive information for you there. Um, but just note that with financial aid and with things like grants and uh, merit aids and scholarships awarded, um, you know, a lot of students see these uh, costs uh, go down significantly. Uh, so that's something to take note of. Um, our other online events uh, are here uh, listed out. You can see them. So we have conversations with UMass that is a student panel. So it's a, it's a very casual experience. You would hop on the Zoom call and just have a conversation with current UMass students. There are also student guided tours or, or visits rather, as you can see here. So again, it's just getting that firsthand experience from students on the UMass experience. We have our fall visit days are now virtual. So that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, if you go on our website, uh, umass.edu slash admissions, you'll be able to find all the information as it pertains to all of these events, as well as our virtual tour that we have available as well. Um, and it's brand new, it's not even, uh, it's, it's barely over a year old. So it's still some pretty up-to-date information there as well. And here is our contact information. So uh, if you feel like you have any more questions after today, uh, feel free to email us at mail at admissions at umass.edu. If you have questions for international counselors, so that's anything outside of the continental United States, um, be sure to email them at international admissions at umass.edu. As I mentioned before, financial aid uh, and their email. And if you have any questions for your students that are on campus right now, if you would like to speak to a student um, that represents either an academic interest that you have or um, from the same place that you're from or what have you, you can email tours at umass.edu and they will do their best to um, match you with what you're asking for. Also look for us on our social media. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, they're trying to branch out to some more social media as well. So when we finally get those out, we'll be make sure to update all of you with that as well. Um, and again, look for our UMass Amherst experience uh, online. So um, if you jot down that well, uh, URL, you'll be able to check that out as well. But that is all I have for you all today. That's all we have for you today. Uh, thank you all for taking time to, you know, listen uh, to see what UMass has to offer. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your day or evening or whenever you're watching this. And we hope to see you on campus here one day. So go UMass. <laughs>